When I was young, play was what I lived for. The neighborhood kids and I would go at it right after breakfast till it was too dark to see. We'd get called in for dinner, and for 12 hours, all I could think about was getting back out there. My friends and I were into weird stuff, like making swords and shields and other weapons out of wood, create characters for ourselves and these ridiculously complex plots. Which is funny now that I think about it, because all we really wanted to do was hit each other with sticks. But when we played, the time flew by so fast you didn't even notice it. Whole days would just disappear. I want to share a quote with you. What did you do as a child that made the hours pass like minutes? Therein lies the key to your earthly pursuits. So, I'm asking you, what did you do as a child that made the hours pass like minutes? Close your eyes. Seriously, close your eyes. I want you to pick a memory and relive it with me. It's one of those long summer days and you're playing outside with your friends. I want you to visualize the place. See the sun in the trees, on the grass. Feel the sun on your face, your arms, your neck. Hear the sounds of this place, the shouts of other kids, traffic, whatever's around you. Feel the temperature, the humidity on your skin, the breeze as it hits your body. Smell the smells in the air. Now, see your friends. See the light on their skin. Hear their voices. Feel the excitement of whatever it is you're playing. Now, stay here for a moment in this time. This time when it was okay to lose yourself in play all day long. In this place, you can be who you want to be. Do what you want to do. Here you can break all the rules with no repercussions. You can live countless lives with no fear of judgment. In play, anything is possible. Okay, open your eyes. For most of us, that's all play is now. Just a fleeting memory of something valuable that was lost. If you feel a pang, that's because the loss of play in our lives is serious. It hurts. From the beginning, play shapes us. It sharpens our senses, jumpstarts and fuels our intelligence. Play increases social awareness and sparks the imagination. Sociologists, psychologists, and educators have been saying the same thing for over a hundred years, that play is an absolutely essential part of human growth and development. Sadly though, and for whatever reasons, by the time most of us reach our 30s, we've almost totally forgotten how amazing it is to play. And I'm not talking about board games or organized sports. I'm talking about forms of play that offer the freedom to improvise, to be creative, to, to let our imaginations run wild like when we were kids. Even though play is so absolutely crucial to our learning and socialization, educationally, it starts to disappear from our lives soon after primary school. Personally, I put most of the blame for that, at least in my country, on an obsession with standardized testing. 
the pressure to test well that we put on our kids is crazy and too often results in a shift from a life of the imagination, exploration, and creativity to one of logic, reason, and rote memorization. And that seems tragic to me. But I know, I know, fine arts major, he's biased. So that's a heated conversation for another day. What I want to talk about today is doctor training. Nowhere is there a more intense pressure to test well and crush the competition than in the medical field. Everybody knows how cutthroat med school is. By the time they've been admitted to a program, potential doctors have already established themselves as elite scholars, the best of the best at the test. Unfortunately, success in the competitive arena can come at a price. And that price is an emotional one. The shift from learning that's communal and playful to learning through winner-take-all competition and one-upsmanship can eventually lead to emotional barriers, slowly and subtly erected between themselves and the outside world. My point is this, and it's a scary one. Later on, these walls between the self and others can start to negatively impact the doctor-patient relationship. I recently read a book that freaked me out. Every Patient Tells a Story by Lisa Sanders. In this book, she speaks about the information exchange between doctor and patient and how most doctors only listen to their patient for an average of 16 seconds before interrupting. Some breaking in after only three seconds. But the detail that really left a mark is that after the patients were interrupted, only 2% of them resumed their story. These statistics are disturbing, but we can't put all the blame on the doctors for their breakdown in communication. The reasons are obviously wide ranging, but here are a few I think are important to think about. First, the idea that the doctor must always be right is something I, I call the omniscience imperative. Let's face it, we all want our doctor to be infallible, if not fully godlike. It's not fair to them. We want them to have all the answers and to be right every time. We need them to be. And that must be such a huge burden to bear. So much that many doctors choose to wall themselves up for protection in an unassailable self-certainty. But this aggressive sense of certainty can also be a detriment to reciprocal, collaborative communication with others. Second, a good friend of mine once told me that the first time he sank a scalpel into a cadaver, it became necessary to detach himself emotionally from the reality that this was a human being under his knife. A human being who lived and loved and endured all of life's ups and downs, just like himself. Doctors refer to this as the hidden curriculum, and many describe it as an unspoken aspect of their training that subtly influences them to disengage emotionally from their patients. On the one hand, it makes total sense to close yourself off from the painful emotional effects of so much suffering and dying. But on the other, cutting yourself off from emotional relationships with the people around you can be harmful to your psyche in the long run. And the big one. The pressure to see more and more patients can make for a grinding time crunch that results in a very short time spent with each patient. Can you imagine only being given on average one to three minutes to make life or death decisions regarding someone's health? Someone who's depending on you for their life to diagnose them properly? Think about what kind of stress that must cause. And that's the situation many doctors face every day. So, what's the solution to such deeply systemic problems. What big idea 
could I, as a lifelong theater practitioner, propose to improve both clinical outcomes and doctor resiliency? That's right. Clinical improv. And I know what you're thinking. It's not the same as comedy improv. It's not about the participants zinging each other to make an audience laugh. In fact, it's not about an audience at all. Clinical improv is an educational tool for improving the communication and relationship building skills of students in their first or second year of medical training. Its primary focus is on active listening, close observation, and collaboration. Clinical improv is based on one central concept, the yes and. Yes and exercises are at the heart of clinical improv because they demonstrate very clearly the collaborative back and forth nature of good communication. Yes anding is simple. You basically take in whatever your partner says and then add to it. For example, you come on stage and your partner says, Waiter, there's a cockroach in my casserole. And you quickly reply, My deepest apologies, sir. That was for table number four. See what I mean? Simple. So, let's break that exchange down into its component parts. Waiter, there's a cockroach in my casserole, is your partner's offer. You then yes, yes that with, my deepest apologies, sir, and and it by adding, that was for table number four. Easy, right? Okay, it takes a little practice, but almost anyone can master it. Some additional rules for yes anding are, one, Make your partner look and feel good, always. You're there to support them and build something together, not to get a laugh at their expense. Two, say the first thing that pops into your head. Don't think too hard, don't try to be funny or clever, and don't censor yourself, but always remember rule number one, and don't be creepy or offensive which can make your partner feel weird and shut them down creatively. Three, in improv, whatever your partner says, you must accept it. Go with it and try not to reject their offer. For example, you come on stage and your partner greets you with, Good morning, son. How are you today? What you don't say is, I'm not your son. I'm an assassin here to kill you. Although, that is a really cool concept for a Netflix series. In this situation, it ends the flow of communication and kills the improv. A more collaborative response would be, Good morning, Father. By the way, I wrecked the car last night. Which, though less interesting, honors the offer, builds on it, and sends an offer back in return. You see how yes ending teaches you to accept what your partner is offering, to give up control of the interaction, and create something new together. The value of this principle to effective communication and relationship building, to me, seems super clear. It also allows for risk-taking. Everybody gets to be silly. In fact, it's required. No one gets to be too cool for school. In a place where there can be no mistakes, there can be no wrong answers. Just like when you were a kid, you get to explore and create with no fear of judgment. It supports and validates each participant. Making your partner look good is the first rule. And that's because people who are made to feel special shine brighter. They feel better about themselves and then can live up to a higher potential. It broadens and enriches relationships. The fact that you were pushed to give constant encouragement and support to your partner is invaluable for team building and collaboration. It improves observational skills. If you believe the current research on body language, over 70% of communication is nonverbal. 
the implications this skill has for broadening communication and increasing the information exchange are obvious. And it creates healthful social connections. Studies show that having many meaningful personal and social relationships actually prolongs life. It, it reduces depression, increases happiness, and promotes overall physical health. It also bolsters the emotional well-being of the doctor. Being playful insulates doctors against the day-to-day -day stresses of the job. When you genuinely enjoy what you do, life is more rewarding and productive. And finally, it provides an energized, fun atmosphere. Even though being funny isn't the primary objective of clinical improv, it does tend to generate a good amount of laughter among the participants. And science has shown us that laughter lowers blood pressure, activates the body's immune system, reduces stress, and soothes anxiety. So, to wrap it up, I am convinced that the inclusion of clinical improv in doctor training can be a benefit to everyone involved. At the very least, as an experiment, it presents little to no risk, and there's honestly no downside that I can think of. The students don't have to prepare anything, there's no memorization involved, and guess what? There's no test at the end. Just by showing up and participating, they can improve therapeutic outcomes with their patients and make their own lives better. Plus, it's just a damn good time.